Hi, and welcome to this latest immigration law conversation. I'm joined again by a repeat guest. Chris Cole is back uh, about six months ago. We had a conversation about digital appeals uh, and he's back for a second time. So thank you so much, Chris. And we're going to have a look at my HMCTS, appeal skeleton arguments, the CVP platform uh, and much more. So thank you, Chris, for joining me again. Um, this is not legal advice. Hopefully it's an informative, helpful discussion for lawyers and others who will find useful our, our comments. And, and thank you so much for your patience, Chris. What people won't know is this act is actually our third uh, conversation because last week we tried to do this conversation. I, I had a complete internet failure, which is interesting because these are some of the issues we come across today exactly. dealing with digital appeals. So Chris, before we get into it, tell us a bit about you and what you do. Well, I'm an immigration solicitor, have been for you know, 20 or 25 years, mm -hmm. getting on now, feeling very old. Uh, for the past few years, I've been a partner at Parker Rhodes Hickmots in Rotherham, but recently stood down as a partner to look at other opportunities and to be a bit more flexible. I'm, I work there still as a consultant, but uh, I've recently taken up a position at Sheffield Hallam University. I've got a refugee rights hub that deals with specialising in refugee family reunion, which is an interesting opportunity. Um, I do other bits and pieces, and for the last couple of years, I've also sat as a fee-paid immigration judge at the tribunal in Manchester, which gives me another insight into appeals and so on. No, that, that's really helpful, Chris, and hopefully we can draw from that, those multiple angles you can come mm -hmm. from. Um, and in terms of digital appeals, your, your fingerprints are all over them. You've, you've been involved from early days. What was your involvement with digital appeals? Well, yes, I, I, I was involved right from sort of the inception it was it was judge zucker who's the the resident judge in bradford who was sort of the, the driver for the tribunal behind this this reform package and we had meetings with him right from the beginning um as my role on the immigration law committee at the law society we were consulted at various stages through the pilots and so on uh, we've had lots of consultation with my with with hmcts about the platform and they still come back to me to you know, try and Get my views on when they're developing you know amendments and changes to the system so yeah i've tried to have a lot of input into it to make sure it you know hopefully gets more user friendly as it, as it moves along and improves we're now we're now sort of six months down the line or so a bit more than six months since the sort of practice directions came into force in june of 2020 where appeals need to be lodged by the new digital platform how do you think you, the platform is working and both from your perspective uh, uh, as a solicitor and perhaps as a judge. Uh, uh, so how's it working? Certainly as, as, a, as a rep, when, I'm, when I'm, I'm dealing with clients, things, lodging appeals and managing appeals through the, the portal, through the My HMCTS platform, I find pretty straightforward. Lodging appeals and so on is, is, is really easy and quick. And I like the fact that everything's there in one place, one portal, and that's the way you now communicate. Um, I think that's that's really helpful and i'd still like the fact that in theory you know you don't get a hearing until everything's prepared so once you get to court everything's been done everything's been looked at you're much you know it's, it's much less likely to have last minute adjournments because you don't get a hearing until it's ready i like the use of the hearing bundles it's a, sort of a, a stitched bundle that the tribunal case workers put together for the hearing so it's, it's you know it, it's got everything in one place and I, I find that during hearings whether as, a, as, a, as the advocate or as the judge referring to that pdf and the page numbers there and navigating through that in, in one document makes life a lot easier i find no, that that's helpful i think as counsel i've certainly found that what judges want is tell me that PDF number. They've got that key, that mm. core bundle, and it is great to have it all in one place. Obviously, still as counsel, there's still that difficulty of accessing the system. So hopefully, if you're counsel watching, or if you're a representative instructing counsel, make sure they have a copy of that core PDF bundle that has been created for the hearing, because that's what the presenting officer will have, and that's what 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 the judge will mm. have certainly. And what about some challenges you, you, you've seen come up in terms of, uh, of the system? I think that as far as hearings are concerned, sitting as a judge, and this, I think this, was, this will pass, is that 
everything seems to be a bit out of date now. Mm. The, the pandemic and, and lockdowns and things meant that there were a whole load of obviously of cases that were ready to have a hearing in spring probably of last year or the middle of last year and are only getting listed now. And I find that there are lots of reps that aren't double checking and updating their bundles or putting in the most current information prior to the hearing. I think they think, well, okay, I dealt with that six months ago. I don't have to worry about it. And I think it's really important that you know, I know we're all constrained by legal aid usually, but even so, before you get to the hearing, you know, if you know you've got a hearing in two or three weeks' time, check that everything's up to date, check whether there's a new, you know, sip in or whether there's some new country information. And uploading additional documents is relatively straightforward from the portal. Um, there's an upload additional evidence sort of um, tab that you click on. You have to give a reason, but usually if a case has been sitting waiting for a hearing for a few months, that's all you have to explain, that you know, updated country information. But it's much better to do it as early as possible so that it then gets included in that stitched hearing bundle, which is really important. Because I have seen cases where reps have uploaded information right at the last minute, like the day before the hearing. And then you end up a bit like in the old days when you had sort of three or four different pieces of paper, which is really frustrating. So check your appeals as soon as you know the hearing date, upload any additional evidence as soon as possible so that it can get included in the in the consolidated hearing bundle. That's my advice. And will, do you find, as long as it's not sort of 4 p.m. the day before, will the tribunal case work, work out automatically then to use your, like, stitch it into the main bundle? I, I've never experienced a, a problem. I've never heard of you know, additional evidence being turned down or being told, no, sorry, you, you know, this won't be acceptable. And as long as it's, I, I think normally it's, it's four or five days before the hearing that they put together the stitched bundle so as long as you're doing it you know a week before the hearing then it'll end up within the, the you know the composite you know consolidated hearing bundle which i say makes life a lot easier for, for all the parties if if you're referring to just one bundle with one set of numbering no that's helpful chris so i, th I suppose practitioners need to be familiar with the system to make sure their bundles are updated and everything's uploaded and obviously I've made reference there to the tribunal caseworker. It, it seemed to me that one of the key new roles within the tribunal that's come with the digital system and a key relationship perhaps for representatives to have is with the tribunal ca caseworker. Perhaps you can speak to that. Well, exactly. Yeah. The, the tribunal caseworkers have the day-to-day -day management of all the cases um, on my HMCTS. So anytime you make any sort of application or anything happens, it is done initially by a tribunal caseworker. When the system was first introduced, there would be a lot of sort of emailing to and fro with, with tribunal caseworkers, which worked fine, but now they have, there's more communication on, on the system itself. You now have the ability to make applications um, on, on my HMCTS rather than just having to email them. And I, I find that a, a useful, uh, system and it, and it seems to have worked pretty well. I think last time we spoke, I was a bit concerned about the tribunal caseworkers just being overwhelmed when this was was rolled out much more widely. But so far, they seem to be managing. I think it, I have found some sort of blips and so on. But I know that they've employed there are more TCWs at each of the hearing centres and. Generally, I think they seem to be you know, still responding relatively quickly and um, dealing with things accurately. There's always, whenever you make any application and it's decided by TCW, if you don't like the decision, you can renew it to a judge. I haven't yet had to renew any applications to a judge. So I think that's got to be a positive sign. No, that absolutely. And just that's something I think practitioners as another takeaway need to be aware of that when you get that order from from a, a TCW and perhaps say refusing your adjournment or refusing yeah. um, to allow you to admit new evidence. Obviously, it, it is actually if you're, you're communicating good time, you're unlikely to get that. But if you do get it, you can renew it then direct to a judge. And that's important for people to be aware of what happens when things go wrong. An example that I know we've chatted about is perhaps I've certainly had solicitors come to me when things should have been lodged on the new system, 
but perhaps solicitors caught still in the old system oh. of putting, putting an old appeal and then they get this notice saying we're not going to do anything unless you put this via my HMCTS. What about situations like that? Yeah, I, I've experienced one of these myself where I had one of these letters come through and I was, oh, it was sent by email. Um, and it daunted me a bit because I thought I'd done everything right. And, and it's you know, a bit concerning. In my particular case, I still think I've done everything right because my client was in detention and you, you know, one of the tick boxes at the, be at the beginning, if they're in detention, you can't use the new system. So hopefully that's going to be okay. Although, as I say, it's, it was a sort of like odd way you had to respond to them, just emailing back customer service. Um, I did get a, a, you know, a receipt for that, but I still don't know what's actually happened, whether it is proceeding or not. I think in other cases where it's just you know, you'd forgotten or you haven't, because you, know, you don't do many appeals, you haven't registered with my aim, HMCTS, or, all you can really do is hold your hands up and apologize, say, look, sorry, my mistake, didn't realize it, don't blame the appellant, I'll get it sorted, lodge it on my HMCTS straight away, and then put that explanation when you lodge it, because it's likely to be out of time by the time you get one of those notifications. I think it'd be very harsh to penalize anyone if they are you know, contrite about it and say, sorry, my fault. It's a new system. We're all learning new things. There are going to be you know, problems like this that, that happen occasionally. And honesty is the best policy. And just say, sorry, make sure it won't happen again. No, I, I think that's got to be right. Certainly my advice to, to the representative who, who this came up with was to lodge it by my HMCTS, mm -hmm. put an explanation, put an out of time uh, appeal in, but also take the blame for it, say, my fault, exactly. not, not the clients. We didn't know. We've now registered for my HMCTS, no prejudice. And hopefully there's still some grace uh, around because it is, a, as you say, a, a relatively new system and everybody's sort of learning uh, uh, as mm. we go. The other thing previously we talked about was the, the appeal skeleton argument. I know there's been a lot of talk about the appeal skeleton argument or perhaps some tribunal centres now when they send out directions call them case summaries now, but obviously there's this structure where there has to be a summary, a schedule of issues and submissions. What do you think makes an effective appeal skeleton argument, both in terms it's odd because they've got this twin purpose. One of it is to trigger a re review by the Home Office mm. and hopefully get some meaningful concessions. I don't know if we're, we're seeing many of those. And then a second uh, function is a traditional skeleton argument function in terms of the argument that's presented at the appeal hearing. So what's your thoughts about appeal skeleton arguments? I think the important thing about them is that they're focused. Yeah. I've seen some that have just a bit sort of old school cut and paste, you know, just shove all the law in, which is not what they're about. I think what you really need to think about when drafting one is, why is this decision wrong? And just try and be as succinct as possible to say, well, you know, the Home Office has got X, Y, and Z wrong. And in fact, the appeal should be allowed for A, B, and C reasons. They don't have to be, I don't think, really lengthy, detailed documents. It's, I say, to highlight what are the problems with the Home Office decision-making and why does your client actually come within, you know, the Refugee Convention, the immigration rules, the, what, whatever type of appeal it is. And the more sort of focused you can do that, I think the more chance that you're going to get to sort of narrow the issues and perhaps potentially get some concessions, although... I, I'm not convinced. I, I, I think when we spoke about this before, I felt that the Home Office, with their reviews, would become more and more generic as they had more and more to deal with. I don't know. I, I get a feeling they are a bit like that. I, I see the same sort of fairly bland Home Office reviews which is frustrating because I know reps are putting a lot of effort into the appeal skeleton arguments and they're not getting remunerated very well for doing it. And you want the Home Office to engage. If you think that you've got a decent case and you can put you know, that clearly, you want the Home Office to engage and say, okay, fair enough, we've got this wrong. 
I don't know about your experience, Adam, but I'm not I'm not really seeing those reviews engaging as well as I I you know had hoped that they would do. No, at the start, I, I certainly in and during the summer we saw some engagement, mm. some entry clearance cases where you particularly pointed out that an aspect, say, of maintenance was met or a wrong rule was applied. But now I'm seeing more of the generic sort of reviews. And, and interestingly, in entry clearance cases, I've now seen the Home Office bundle, instead of having an entry clearance manager's review in the standard form at the back, has this sort of preliminary respondents review, which is just this cigarette paper standard paragraph. Yes. And I, I don't know if that's to say, well, we've done our review, you know, so it, it's, yeah, I, I think it is frustrating that we're not seeing meaningful engagement with that. It's still worth doing because it may be something, mm. there's obvious issues you can use as a means of applying for costs. I know costs are a, bit, a big issue, uh, but something perhaps in particular. Yeah, I, in the I, 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 I agree with that. And that, can, that could be one way of doing it. If, if you've got a clear issue that in your ASA, you said that this should be allowed for this reason. The Home Office don't engage with that. And then you win on the appeal yeah. on that exact point. I think you've got very strong grounds for asking for, for wasted costs. Um, so I, I think reps have to be a bit more sort of proactive about looking at costs because the tribunal doesn't really have many ways of, of, of punishing people for not complying or only paying lip service to directions and so on. So. I think sometimes reps have to act as well. My concern is if the Home Office reviews get more standard and become a bit blander, then that will put reps off doing proper appeal skeleton arguments. And then it will, the whole thing will sort of falter. It was a bit like back in the days when we first had proper oral case management review hearings. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, there's going to be real engagement. We're going to talk about the issues and presenting officers will concede matters for a few months possibly <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that but then it soon became you know, a, a sort of a tick box exercise you turn up and the home office said yeah we're going to rely on the refusal letter yes we're ready to proceed and you it was they became pointless which is why they were eventually scrapped i don't want this to go down the same route and for that reason it's really important that the home office engage properly and, and you know can't just heap the blame on on reps no i, I think certainly I, I think there are value and if you know certainly i, I encourage representatives to get that it's, it's re-educating clients and representatives to get the bundle done at an early stage mm. and to send me as counsel a paginated final bundle so i can do an asa that says right this page has the evidence of this here's the evidence of this so it, it puts the pressure mm. on certainly and I think what you say is absolutely right. Something succinct, as, as sometimes as counsel, especially for those of us who are case law geeks, you love ci citing the, the latest jurisprudence on this, but actually a case worker is not probably going to overturn a case on the basis of your clever citations of case law. It's actually saying, well, you've got this wrong. Here's the evidence for that. And just pointing out the specific mm. evidence. What I found in Birmingham, there was a stage where where the respondent hadn't engaged in a review, the tribunal were then listing for oral CMRs. Although in privately paying cases, we sort of wrote back and said to the tribunal, well, well, no, no, thank you, we're ready to proceed. Let's not waste any of our clients' costs. If they're not engaging, let's just proceed to a hearing. So yeah, no, hopefully we will see home office engagement to come. So that- I, 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 Can I just point one, one, one interesting thing, if you're doing, uh, preparing an ASA in a, protection claim is when you're looking at the refusal letter particularly now that we're getting more and more of them electronically click on the links you know that they they yep. link country information they'll say you know your what you've said is inconsistent with you know external country information and then put a footnote and there'll be a link a hyperlink at the bottom when when those were paper there's no way that you're going to type all of that into your, your, into google but if you're getting them electronically, you can just click on them. The number of times that you read what they're referring to, and it, it doesn't say what the Home Office alleged says. And I found that really good way of you know, saying, well, you quote this you know, article in support of your argument. Well, this is what this article actually says. And you know, I think that's quite effective, you know, using their own country information to undermine their own 
arguments. I think that's very clever. And I suppose what you could do then is extract the actual country information mm. into your bundle to say, well, well, this is what it actually says. And I know well, you... Go on, the, the, the best one I had of this was um, an Iranian, fairly typical Kurdish smuggler. Um, so he was going from Iran over the border into Iraq and backwards and forwards. They found somewhere roughly where he lived. And they said, you know, Google Maps says that it's, you know, four and a half hours drive to the border with Iraq. And they, and they you know, they quoted the link. You click on it and it actually showed the direction, went all the way around, sort of via Tehran, seriously, <laughs> down to a formal border crossing. And it, no, he gets his mule and he goes across the mountains. So when he says, you know, it's that long across the mountain, so please check these things. Don't, don't assume that you know, those articles that, that they reference actually support their own arguments, because often they don't. No, I think that's so helpful. And something else you pointed out to me was obviously, and you've, you've mentioned already, is developments in the country evidence. So in, you mm. pointed out, because you, you're the Iraq expert, certainly the, the developments in the Iraqi seeping and then the newer information that postdates SMO about the ability to get CSID documents through the embassy in London. So people need to be aware is the Home Office referring to the most up-to-date country evidence? Have there been developments? And then in your ASA, you can you can set that out. Right. I'm conscious of time and that Zoom's not going to cut us off. So let's uh, just a couple of more questions I, I, I want to ask you. Just in, no, not at all. in terms of CVP hearings, any any practical suggestions? I, I certainly as counsel, um, uh, uh, because I'm not meeting clients at court, I think it's essential for representatives to organise, like we're on Zoom today, a Zoom yeah. conference with counsel, perhaps solicitor and the clients beforehand. So you don't want your barrister or your representative meeting the client for the first time on the CVP platform live to give evidence. So that's been an essential for me, certainly to have pre-hearing video conferences. Any other sort of practice? Oh, yeah, I, I definitely think that's right. You need you need to have that because you don't have the, that opportunity in the same way when you're doing a remote hearing. Mm. So some of the tips are things like remember it is an actual hearing. Yeah. You take it as seriously as if you were there in the courtroom. I'm amazed. You know, today, I've got a bit of a busy background. When I do CVP hearings, I make sure that I'm in a room with a blank wall, if, if possible, behind me. At home, when I'm doing them, I have this, this um, painting on the wall. Take it off, put it on the floor so it's just a blank screen. I've seen people with bags of things and just mess. And also, as I say, remember it's a hearing. So wear a suit. Well, not today, because it's not a hearing, but... <laughs> wear your same attire it mm. amazes me that people think they can just bowl up in you know, shirt sleeves almost and you've got to ignore and be prepared for distractions yeah i had i had um quite senior experienced counsel um, when i was i was the judge and in the middle of the hearing he got up didn't say excuse me didn't mute himself in the middle of his submissions got up went to the window opened the window and started shouting to the amazon delivery man <laughs> So just leave it there, just leave it there. I'm on the phone. Well, no, you're not. You're in a court hearing. You wouldn't do that in the actual building. And then when I was a rep, I, you know, I was doing one bail hearing. The judge, two or three times, his, you know, certainly looked older, children, wandered in and started talking to him. And I know, you know, homeschooling and children, it can be, a, it can be difficult. But, you know, make sure that you have a quiet space where you can you know, be on your own and without disturbances and make sure you treat it like a proper hearing and make sure you prepare if, if you're a rep like you say prepare your clients speak to them have a zoom meeting beforehand or a few of them to get them used to it's not the, it's not identical technology but it's 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 the same but get them used to talking into the camera you know where to look at you know so on and so forth um, it, it makes a difference than I, I going that, unprepared. That's so important preparing that people getting used to giving evidence over the video, explaining to them they, they shouldn't be in the same room if there's multiple witnesses. Mm. You know, that, that's yeah, so important, definitely. And it, it makes the difference, that preparation. And for me as counsel, I often like to have 
the phone number of my solicitor. And if anything goes wrong, yeah. I can text my solicitor during the hearing and check things um, while the CVP hearing is, is going on, certainly. Now, before we go, Chris, I couldn't resist but ask you, your name was in lights recently by from the upper tribunal in a case called Nedawaini. Uh, it, it's about uh, uh, permission to appeal and challenging erroneous decisions on timeliness, perhaps in, in a minute or two, you could just tell us about that. Why has that been reported and what's that about? Well, well, it's a good question. Why has it been reported? Um, it was a weird one where the Home Office knew that their application was out of time because of you know, Christmas and so on, um, and came and had asked for an extension for really lame reasons, saying, well, we don't have enough staff during the, the Christmas and New Year holiday. But then the judge had sort of ignored that and said, oh, you know, Christmas and uh, New Year don't count and treated it as in time. Now, the question became, do you treat that as the judge has exercised his discretion to extend time, so you have to challenge it by way of judicial review? Or is it in the same as those cases where a judge has just, you know, not noticed that it was out of time, when you would then, that can be dealt with as a preliminary matter by the upper tribunal. I felt that the judge hadn't exercised his discretion. Extending time is an exercise of discretion and he hasn't done that. So I felt it was the same as if he'd just you know, not noticed. But upper tribunal judge Lane didn't agree and felt that it was, it doesn't matter whether we all agreed the judge was wrong and the judge hadn't exercised his discretion to extend time, but the fact is the judge had made a decision in relation to timeliness, and therefore the only way to challenge it, he felt, was by way of judicial review. Obviously that sort of fell away because you know, our appellant, well, he was the respondent by that stage, but my client was successful, and so it, it didn't really make any difference in our case, but it was just, I, I still don't agree with the decision, but mm. you know, the upper tribunal love reporting these sort of dry procedural matters. No, absolutely. Say, no, absolutely. Uh, what I'll do, I'll put the link below this video, but essentially, upper tribunal judge Lane found that it was an excluded decision, could yes. only be challenged by way of judicial review, but found no error of law in your uh, your allowed appeal. So that your client was ultimately successful, which is, is interesting, but it's worth people looking at mm. if they get, say, a, dis a decision to. Uh, grant the Home Office permission to appeal, which was obviously out of time. So it's it, it's something to certainly uh, be aware of. Chris, we've covered we've covered we seem to have covered everything in, in this time. We've covered CVP, we've covered my HMCTS, we've covered permission to appeal and appellate and appeal skeleton arguments. If people want to get in touch with you or people are watching uh, at this video uh, and, and want to instruct you, perhaps lay clients, how do people get in touch with you? Well, in, in, for my work at, at Parker Roads, as I say I'm still a consultant here, and so I can still be instructed. And um, people can more than happy for people to email me directly. Uh, it's just Chris Cole at prhsolicitors.co.uk. No, that that's fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. I think people will find this. Uh, really helpful uh, and there's some really practical tips and I would encourage people there's still I think some people out there who haven't fully engaged with my HMCTS yeah. logged on got familiar with the system but whatever happens with lockdowns ending uh, this is not going anywhere and we're only going to see this increase and, and digital appeals are here to stay so I think people have definitely exactly. got to embrace technology definitely um, definitely Chris, thank you so much for the for your time. Hopefully, we can do another round uh, again, and we'll have no technological problems. So that that's great. But thanks so much, Chris. Right, well, thank you very much for having me, Adam. Lovely to speak again. Bye bye.